Balize Riven um, visit us today uh, is a very distinguished scholar uh, who's uh, worked a great deal on, on Islam particularly and has a number of publications and is a prolific uh, writer and, and, and has published several books um, the most important of which I think which has gone into four or five or six now uh, editions is Islam in the World published by Oxford University Press and he's done other publications on fundamentalism he's worked for the BBC British Broadcasting Corporation uh, he has a master's degree in English literature and a PhD in social and political sciences from Cambridge University um, he's going to talk to us about something that is very current uh, you know, current affair uh, that, that while it is taking place seeming, in a seemingly further region from India you know, in, the, in West Asia but also affecting parts of Europe certainly now politically uh, and in many other ways uh, about the emergence of ISIS or ISIL or Daesh I don't know, there are several ways of uh, talking about this group and I think the questions that you will be raising in your talk, or certainly we will be raising afterwards, uh, uh, concern the relationship between secular states and religion, and the emergence of religious identities within the secular state, and also the question of the relationship between religion and violence, and how that is viewed from the point of view of the secular state. And I think particularly, what's particularly going to be interesting in Professor Riven's talk is the definition and our understanding of what constitutes terrorism and how we identify groups and communities as being terrorists or not. And I think that leads to a critical inquiry into that very word, into that very terminology, because it's all pervasive at the moment in media as well as in, in, in academia. So we look forward to your talk, and this is sort of we're winding down term now, so um, not everybody's here. It's exam time and reading time, people and students are submitting assignments. But thank you very much for visiting us. It's a huge pleasure and honor to be here and you are kind of to be here at the beginning is something very special because you're going to be growing, I'm sure, very rapidly over the next uh, decades. And uh, I can tell my grandchildren who uh, some of them live here that you know I was there at the start. And that uh, always gives you a very nice feeling. And uh, thank you especially to my friend uh, Somnath, who um, I traveled around uh, Gujarat with some years ago. Um, and he is now, rather like me, he's jumped horses, he's moved from one profession to another, he's now becoming a distinguished academic, uh, which is, uh, I, I wouldn't describe myself as, as distinguished, but I have also rather changed horses myself in career. I worked for many years for the BBC in London uh, and then it does behave rather like a sort of godfather organization. Um, there came a point when they were rather annoyed at my perspectives on US foreign policy in the Middle East, which I was publishing outside the BBC. They made me the proverbial offer I couldn't refuse and uh, I then switched to teaching. The rather naive thought that perhaps when you're a journalist you're always having to find new stories, um, which is quite taxing and demanding. I thought, oh, great thing. If I go into lecturing, I just use the same lecture over and over again. It's not such hard work. But actually you very quickly find that it's a bit tough because you have to pick up with the, with the, the, um, you know, the new material that's coming. And uh, that is its own kind of challenge, plus the fact that, of course, the interesting thing about teaching in uh, universities is you're always teaching roughly guys the same age. They stay the same because they're coming through. You yourself are getting older and older and older, and so the gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Which can be a little discomforting after time, especially when everyone's texting and uh, you've got some banana shapes and you're a bit sort of limited in that way. So I'd rather stick to uh, what I started my career with now, which is simply writing. Uh, I'm not teaching anymore, so forgive me if you find a few little 
senior moments coming up now and then, which I'm afraid when you're in your mid-70s is something that tends to happen. Um, as uh, the professor explained, the dean explained in the introduction, we want to talk this afternoon about uh, the extraordinary evolution of ISIS, also known as Daesh from its uh, Arabic initials. Uh, and of course, in Europe, the particular concern isn't just about the terrorist incidents, the last uh, attack we saw in, uh, in Paris, but the skills in uh, recruiting young Muslims, and not just Muslims, in uh, re recruiting young uh, converts, uh, some of them even from quite privileged families, uh, to go and join them uh, in the Islamic Caliphate they've established on the basis of Raqqa in Syria, and of course they are still in control of uh, Iraq's second city of Mosul. Um, there has been a general sort of tendency in the media in, in, in Britain to look at the guys who join ISIS as kind of archetypal losers, uh, people who can't find girlfriends or people who don't have good career prospects. But this simply, uh, well, this you know, this may be something that uh, some individuals conform to. Um, it's only a small part of the picture. As some of the better informed academics have explained, many ISIS operatives are highly accomplished individuals who could have made successful careers in their countries of origin had they so chosen. Dismissing ISIS as a terrorist organization is also highly problematic. Terrorists are usually freelance guerrillas who do not necessarily hold territory as ISIS does. And terrorism, as Richard English, uh, who's a, actually someone I know, but he's written a book on terrorism, uh, having spent some of his time in Northern Ireland. Um, in his book, Terrorism, How to Respond, which was published in 2009, um, he points out it has a huge number of definitions. And in fact, that's a, a separate subject, which will perhaps come up later in the Q&A. But um, it, most of the terrorist uh, definitions, however you seek to see terrorism and whether one's talking as a terrorist, <coughs> basically, non-state actors, which is one way of describing them, they tend to conform to the formula of the great um, theoretician of war, uh, Clausewitz, who points out, uh, if our opponent is made to comply with our will, we must place him in a situation which is more oppressive to him than the sacrifice which we demand for ourselves, of ourselves. Um, he also adds, the breaking of the enemy's will through exploitation of fear could be applied to campaigns by state belligerents as well as non-state actors. So in fact, you know, when we're talking terrorism, it is a highly problematic term. The question I think that exercises many people at the present time is not it just is ISIS a terrorist organization, which I'll come to that in a second, but um, is there a way in which our compliance to their will makes any sense at all? Um, I think the question that really arises, are they rational actors at all? Or are they simply guys who want to make a lot of noise, kill a lot of people, make life miserable for everybody without um, asking for any particular demands beyond the right to expand indefinitely and to create a universal Muslim caliphate. Violence, as we know, is inherent in the modern nation state. And of course, most of the violence we witness in contemporary arenas, such as the shock and awe tactics favored in Iraq by former US Secretary of State Colin Powell, yeah, shock and awe, is executed by state authorities in line with Max Weber's definition of the state as a legally, as a legally recognized entity 
having a monopoly of violence. Here, of course, a crucial question of legitimacy arises. There are, in fact, two principal definitions of statehood. Declaratory statehood, which is independent of recognition by other states, and constitutive statehood, requiring recognition by other states. While we may deplore uh, its methods, ISIS uh, meets the criteria of the first, if not the second, since no state so far has yet come to recognize it. This isn't to say that at some point in the future, uh, other states may come to recognize it. However, like most other states, it can plausibly claim to have a monopoly of power in the territory it holds. Unlike other Muslim political entities, it also claims the supranational uh, moral legitimacy of the caliphate. Uh, this is easily dismissed, and indeed has been by most acknowledged institutions of the majority Sunni tradition. The question this raises is, how far does formal rejection or non-acknowledgement by religious authorities and formal institutions dent its appeal for uh, such people? There can be no doubt that most Islamic institutions, whether Sunni or Shia, including the ultra-conservative Salafis, have denied legitimacy to ISIS and condemned it as un-Islamic. A powerful condemnation has been made by the Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, who stated that its crimes against Christians and other minorities have nothing to do with Islam, and the principles of which rather call for justice, kindness, fairness, freedom of faith and coexistence. The Grand Mufti of Al-Azhar, uh, Egypt's highest religious authority, denounced it as a threat to Islam and violated both the Sharia and humanitarian law. Muslim organizations in Europe and North America have been virtually unanimous in condemning ISIS on moral and theological grounds, while Saudi Arabia's highest religious authority, the Grand Mufti, Abdulaziz al-Sheikh has stated that terrorism is anti-Islamic and that groups such as ISIS that practice violence are the number one enemy of Islam. In September 2014, more than 120 Islamic scholars, including Sunnis, Shias, and ultra-Orthodox Salafis, co-signed an 18-page open letter to ISIS to the ISIS leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, written in Arabic, containing a point-by-point -point criticism of its actions and ideology based on the Quran and other classical Muslim texts. The question that arises is how much traction can such statements have with would-be jihadists wanting to sign up with groups such as ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, which are seen as defending Islamic communities and the idea of Islam from the onslaught of barrel bombs by the infidel Assad regimes they see it, or by Shia militias in Iraq, seen as being supported by the Iranian government. While some experts on modern Islam, such as Princeton University's Bernard Heichel, have argued that leaders of ISIS have as much legitimacy as other Islamic authorities in terms of their interpretation of classical texts, um, this is seriously disputed by others, including the influential British convert uh, Timmy, uh, Timothy Winter, a lecturer in Cambridge University, who also writes under the assumed Muslim name of Abdul Hakim Murad, who's also a prolific broadcaster in Britain. Legitimacy, he says, comes from the endorsement of religious leaders, who sees, uh, says Winter, who sees the religious world as being packed with fringe and fundamentalist groups that claim the mantle of total authenticity. To accept such assertions of safe face value, according to Winter, is either naive or tendentious, just as Christianity in Bosnia cannot be reduced to the church-going militias of Radovan Karadzic, or the Judaism, or the whole of Ju the Jewish tradition, to the activities of West Bank settlers who burn down mosques or murder Arab babies. Islam is not represented by ISIS. That's uh, Winter's influential statement. However, representation, I think, is a problematic term in the context of religious conflicts, or conflicts in which participants may be motivated by religious feelings or feelings of solidarity with their co-religionists 
regardless of approval by religious authorities. And here I make a tiny little sort of uh, quote, if you like, from my own uh, country where I was born, which is the Irish Republic. Um, well, it's now the Irish Republic. When I was born there, it was still a free state. But um, in those days, uh, Eamon de, Ver de Valera, um, who was the really founding father of Ireland, rather as uh, Gandhi and Nehru, and of course he was a contemporary of them, the founding fathers of modern India. Uh, de Valera fought uh, against the British, uh, operated, uh, he was one of the few to survive the mass execution uh, of the rebels of 1916, uh, performed by the British, and he was also very active in the civil war that followed between the pro-treaty and the anti-treaty uh, rebel groups uh, who eventually came to power uh, in Ireland. And I had the pleasure, if you like, the sort of free song when I was quite young of seeing the grand old man at the Dublin Horse Show getting into his very old uh, ancient uh, Rolls Royce and driving off after presenting prizes uh, to people, rather in the manner that the British Queen used to present prizes to people in the horse shows. It's funny how things go around in circles. But um, De Valera uh, and many of his colleagues were excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church, although uh, for terrorist activities, because the cardinals who controlled the church were deeply hostile to the tactics that they were using, although the vast majority of Irish Republicans were, of course, uh, of, of Roman Catholic uh, belief. This never stopped them from pursuing their Republican uh, agenda. Um, the question I think it raises vis-a-vis -vis ISIS is that in the case of um, the Roman Catholic Church, there are formal sacramental sanctions which can be applied to someone who is excommunicated. And indeed, some of the Irish Republican heroes, as many of them see them still in Ireland, uh, they were people who were um, uh, deprived of the sacraments of the church, which of course are necessary to gain access to heaven. Um, what you haven't got in the Islamic world, despite there may be a massive consensus of people against uh, ISIS and its operatives, what you haven't got is some kind of formal system of sanction. Um, by a single institution which has that degree of power or authority. What you have instead, of course, is you could say these guys are not Muslims. But then you get into very difficult territory because there is a term which is widely used today, it's called takfir, which is really pronouncing somebody who you disagree with as a hostage. Um, I suppose a rather interesting example of the problematic use of that term is by um, the Saudi Arabian authorities because the chief Saudi um, Muslim leader quite recently, um, because they were facing terrorism at home as well as abroad, um, pronounced, um, he said, Pronouncing takfi on another Muslim is all the combo. You can't do that because everyone's doing it and it sort of devalues the currency. But the kind of response to that was, in fact, I heard him say it himself at a public meeting, uh, came from the former director of Saudi intelligence, uh, Prince Turki Al Faisal, who was a grandson of the founder of Saudi Arabia, son of the former and most successful king. In Faisal, and he said he didn't like to use the word takfir because obviously that's problematic. But what he said instead is the uh, modern ISIS operatives are khawarij. They are like the early khawarijs, groups of Muslims who dissented from the very earliest caliphs and formed a separate group, uh, which funnily enough, has survived in a modified form in Zanzibar and Oman. Uh, and the Hawarij, these guys are Hawarij. But 
this is just playing with words because, you know, most Muslim from the mainstream would see uh, Khawarij as uh, people on whom a pronouncement of takfir has been made. The point really is that in the absence of any central institution, what kind of sanctions, uh, what kind of challenges to be made to the plain religious authority of Baghdadi and his uh, merry friends. In the discursive and polemicized realm of Islamic theology, the issue is far more ambiguous than it is in the case of Ireland, since religious hierarchies and the moral boundaries they police are much less salient. So the pronouncement of takfir, stating that one's opponents are unbelievers, has become the standard trope in polemics between jihadists and not only and their enemies, the evil West and the evil secularists, but also between groups with whom they disagree. Um, so takfirism has generally been uh, thoroughly uh, devalued, and that is a problem of anathematizing a Muslim, if you yourself are a Muslim. The authenticity or legitimacy of the caliphate raises similar difficulties. While the authority of a pope is, with some rare exceptions, uncontested inside the institution he heads and is generally acknowledged, if opposed, by his historic rivals or enemies, be they orthodox, Protestant, secular, or even non-Christian, the caliph is an uncertain and evanescent figurehead whose authority, whether spiritual or secular, has suffered a lengthy decline over the centuries. Except at the very beginnings of Islam, and for a brief period in the High Middle Ages, the Caliphate was not a functioning institution. The Caliphate was contested from the first, of course, with the Shia minority considering that the Caliphate, the leadership of the Islamic community, had been hijacked by Muhammad's former enemies of the Qurayshite tribe. And of course, they believe that the caliphate, or rather the form they choose to call it, the imamate, is here in the direct descendants from the, the prophet's house. Um, the British journalist Jason Burke, who also covers citation affairs from Delhi for the Observer, concurs with this view. In his book, uh, The New Threat from Islamic Militancy, he writes that the caliphate was, from the beginning, an ad hoc arrangement, not specific designed institution, which is one of the reasons why no consensus has ever been reached on exactly what the role of the caliph is. And of course, you could say, well, this gives a certain advantage to the claim legitimacy for uh, Abu Bakr um, and Baghdadi, because one of the points there, I think, is that there is a very strong idea that there ought to be a caliph even if there isn't one. And that's not something new that has just been invented. It goes back certainly to the time when the last Ottoman caliph was um, abolished um, by uh, Ataturk in, in Turkey in 1924. And um, since then, there has been always talk what you might say, a continuous aspiration for the restoration of the caliphate. But what you haven't got is a consensus about what form that restoration uh, should take. I mean, one of the leading uh, Muslim intellectuals in the 1920s, Rashid Rida, wrote a whole book on the caliphate, and he saw it as a kind of new type institution which would embody the aspirations of Islam under some kind of uh, figurehead. Uh, this, of course, would really only apply to Sunnis because uh, Shias have the Imam, um, and uh, I don't want to go into detail about how the Imam originally was a kind of underground leader for the Shias uh, during the Abbasid uh, period uh, up to about uh, the mid 800s. After that, he disappears and becomes an eschatological figure who will one day come back and restore uh, the world to rights. And of course, this is still strongly believed and aspired to 
in the Iranian Islamic Republic. Uh, it was even said that during the uh, presidency of Ahmadinejad, um, who of course we all know was uh, only uh, the son of recent converts to Islam from Judaism in Iran, uh, Ahmadinejad um, would have cabinet meetings but always be an empty chair just in case the Imam comes down and then of course he will uh, take take over. Um, the group that I've been studying these last 20 years, uh, the Ismaili community, of course they have some representatives in India, many in Pakistan, many in Central Asia, East Africa, and uh, also Canada and the United States and Europe. Uh, they have a living Imam which puts them at odds with the 12 Shias who are waiting for the Imam to come down. Although I think to make the distinction is quite a little bit too sharp sometimes because the Ismailis of Tajikistan who lived under communism for many years didn't actually know who the Imam was. Uh, but they used to pray apparently in the privacy of their homes for him to come down just as the international issue do. And then suddenly on May the 25th, I think it was 1995, he shows up in uh, an army helicopter um, and literally the whole Ismaili population of the uh, district of uh, Gornabalik Shah, which is a huge area, about twice the size of Switzerland, with mountains considerably higher, showed up uh, to see him. So the Imam of the water suddenly becomes a real uh, live figure. Of course, since then, he's been setting up development programs in that part of the world. The whole question of the caliphate is extremely problematic, as I'm sure you're beginning to, to realize. And um, there is a kind of notion um, which has been put forward by Wal al-Halak, who's a leading authority on Islamic law and teaches at Columbia University in the US, uh, where he still recognizes that despite it's kind of, you know, sometimes the caliph's there, sometimes he isn't. But the idea of an abstract caliphate um, is really involves the notion that all rulers are not the makers of law. And of course, when we talk about MPs um, in the Lok Sabha or the British Parliament or uh, in, in, um, in America, um, the congressional people, the U.S. press always actually describes them as lawmakers. This is kind of alien to the classical Islamic tradition. You can't make laws because the law comes from God. So the, um, the idea that it represents is that um, all the rulers, all worldly powers are subject to uh, the law, uh, the Sharia law, of God. In former times, the caliphate did provide a significant role of Islamic government, model of Islamic government, that while Halak sees as resting on moral, legal, political, social, and metaphysical foundations that are dramatically different from those sustained, uh, sustaining the modern state. Historically, as he sees it, the moral imperatives of Sharia law were affected outside the domain of the state. And this, I think, is very critical. The political absolute, this is a quote from Halad, um, the political absolute, absolutism that Europe experienced, the merciless serfdom of feudalism, the abuses of the church, the inhuman realities of the Industrial Revolution, and all that which made revolutions necessary in Europe were not, he claims, the lot of Muslims who, comparatively speaking, lived for more than a millennium in a far more egalitarian and merciful system, and most importantly, under a rule of law that modernity cannot fairly blemish with critical detraction. In the 19th century, as I mentioned, the Ottoman sultans um, <coughs> exploited the transnational idea of the caliphate, reviving the institution with a view to countering the protective rights of Russian czars and Habsburg emperors claimed over Christians 
living under Ottoman rule. If the Tsar had rights over Christians living in the Near East and Balkans, the Sultan Caliph could claim the same rights over the Tsar's numerous Muslim subjects. By the same reasoning, he could claim religious rights over the Indian subjects of the British monarch who became emperor in the case of Queen Victoria, <coughs> the Empress of India. The First World War and the Russian and Turkish revolutions ended any such reciprocal notion. Kemal Ataturk, the Turkish National Assembly, uh, and the Turkish National Assembly uh, abolished the Caliphate in 1924. And this decision met with very little resistance in the Middle East following the Arab Revolt. Um, that was one of the reasons it met such little resistance in the Middle East. Um, interestingly, though, of course, and you, a lot of you will know this, uh, the Caliphal idea remained alive in India, where the Khilafat movement, supported by Gandhi, became a rallying point for Mundu, uh, Muslim Hindu resistance against the British Raj. Some modernist-oriented Islamic writers, such as Rashid Vida, thought that the Caliph as a new kind of supreme leader based on election by the national leaders. Yeah. National leaders are often described as the people, classically using a Quranic phrase, the people who bind and loose, the people who have the, the power and authority to bind and loose, which sounds a bit like, you know, sometimes they put you in handcuffs and sometimes they don't. Um, however spurious Abu Baba Baghdadi's claim that the caliphate might see, it would be a mistake to underestimate its appeal for Muslims who feel themselves to be disenfranchised and humiliated. As uh, Jason Burke has suggested, while his claim to the title of caliph may have been dismissed by all major religious authorities and most minor ones too, none would dispute the subtext behind it, the resurrection not simply of a title, but of the power, dignity, wealth, and military renown of Muslim rulers from the 7th to the 18th century. And I think that's really the hub of the matter. The idea of caliphate, however institutionally problematic, um, has behind it um, this vision of uh, power and authority which has been lost uh, and I mention this particularly in the context of the Sunni community because I've just written another essay which uh, I probably have, have a chance to, uh, to read later when it comes out in the New York Review, where I try to make the point that Sunnism has uh, what you might call a triumphalist theology. It's the theology of manifest success. And it's remarkable how many uh, Sunni authorities, even the highly sophisticated ones, would argue that the early conquest of the Arabs uh, following the teachings of uh, Muhammad the Prophet sweeping across uh, the world from central France to the borders of China was a manifestation of uh, their um, good behavior vis-a-vis -vis Islam because they were speaking for God. This is, of course, the absolute opposite of the tradition one finds in Christianity uh, and certainly in um, Shi'ism, the minority Shia tradition, because Shi'as have, over the centuries, had to cope with the problem of loss, with the loss of the caliphate, with the loss of the um, royal family, if you like, the holy family, the holy family particularly, scandal that Ali, uh, who they claim was the nominated heir Muhammad, first he loses his life, stabbed in the back, uh, and then Saddam uh, Hussein is also killed uh, at the Battle of Kabul. So this whole Shia trajectory is one, in a sense, that has to manage failure. And I, I would make the same argument with regard to Christianity in the sense that Many scholars following Albert Schweitzer would say that Christianity began as a classic apocalyptic movement, messianic movement in the Near East um, uh, in late antiquity. And then, of course, its leader is crucified and basically the guys, you can 
rationalizes all sorts of ways, but one theory of resurrection would be that, well, this was a kind of psychological compensation for loss. But then once you've dealt with that, of course, you have the whole trajectory, the complicated relationship between church and state, which emerges. Very different in the Islamic world, because in a sense, church and state didn't have to really work out their relationships because of this uh, common uh, triumph. And uh, I think this is, in a way, part of the problem of, um, of, of, of modern uh, contemporary uh, Sunnism. It's not to say that there aren't hundreds of thousands of millions of Sunnis who are perfectly comfortable with uh, living in the national state. But the national state is in a kind of way precarious uh, in terms of its, what you might call its theological legitimacy. I come from a minority community myself, a Protestant minority of the southern part of Ireland, and they have had to wrestle with this problem for uh, generations. But the Anglican Church, which the Church of Ireland I was born into, has similar um, kind of relationship uh, with power. And of course, what you find in, in the British uh, Constitution, which of course is not written, uh, it's simply there, is the kind of idea that the monarch is also the supreme governor of the church. It's kind of a way of trying to put a lid on the whole religious uh, problem. And it's full of paradoxes. It's very, very different from the American solution, where you have the uh, formal boundaries of church separation. There, of course, we have a lot of other issues come up, particularly over contested uh, questions of um, which ecclesiastical properties uh, you have to pay tax on uh, and all that kind of thing. To get back to our friends in ISIS, unlike Al-Qaeda, which organized acts of terror from remote places, the lawless regions of Pakistan and the Afghan border, ISIS appears to be a highly centralized and disciplined organization with a sophisticated security apparatus and capacity for delegating power. The Caliph, as successor of the Prophet, is the ultimate authority, but despite a sermon Fabadelli made exhorting the believers to advise me when I err, any threat, opposition, or even contradiction is instantly eradicated. Baghdadi has two deputies, both former members of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party. Both were his fellow prisoners in Camp Bucca, a sprawling American detention camp in southern Iraq, now seen as the jihadist university, where former Ba'athists and Sunni insurgents were able to form ideological, personal, and religious bonds. Abu Muslim al-Turkmani, Baghdadi's second in command, was a member of Saddam's feared military intelligence. Uh, Baghdadi's second deputy, Abu Ali al-Anbari, was a major general in the, in the Iraqi army. While skeptics may doubt the sincerity of these ex-parties, and of course the Ba'ath party was essentially a secular party, it was in fact explicitly secular, having been co-founded by a Christian and uh, a Muslim. Um, uh, but um, I had a long discussion with a journalist who, 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 who investigated this, an Arab journalist, and he said it's wrong to consider the Baathist um, joining ISIS as purely opportunistic. You have to remember that after the American invasion, a uh, total collapse of society, the way in which the feared and hated and despised uh, Shia minority uh, suddenly come to power in Baghdad, and then under the Maliki regime, uh, really they operate, they adopted a totally uh, sectarian oriented policy of power, preferment, patronage and so forth, giving it to bad guys and excluding everybody else. And yes, everybody agrees, like the great journalist uh, Patrick Coburn, that um, the ISIS movement begins uh, in a moment of what you might call the Sunni rebellion, the Sunni revolt uh, in Iraq. I think it's wrong to see the Baathists 
is necessarily the ex artist is necessarily purely opportunistic because maybe they felt bad about having abandoned religion when they were working with Sudan. There are all sorts of different possible motivations that come there. But the important thing is these are guys who had a very good military experience. They fought the Iranians uh, in the ATM War between 1980 and 1988. They had uh, all the command and control systems that trained senior military officers know how to operate and of course they knew you know what the score was. And that was certainly an important part of the ISIS armory, uh, what you might call its human resource base. Baghdad and his deputies set the group's overall objectives which are then communicated down the hierarchy with local commanders and administrators allowed to fulfill their tasks at their own discretion in territories under ISIS control. There are advisory councils and several departments run by committees with leaders of each department sitting in Baghdad's, uh, Baghdad's cabinet. Um, Abdul Bari Atwa, the London based journalist who I just mentioned, considered that the number of foreign fighters for the Islamic, um, the, the number of overall fighters for the Islamic State is considerably larger than the 100,000 or so usually cited by Western media, a third of whom, at least 30,000, are said to be foreigners. That's non-Iraqis and non-Syrians. Most numerous, according to the Washington Institute, are Libyans, around 21%, followed by Tunisians and Saudis, 16%, Jordanians, 11%, Egyptians, 10%, Lebanese, 8%. Turkish volunteers, says Akbar, have been underestimated with some 2,000 Turks in ISIS. And these figures are not just volunteers when you think of the personal connections they have in their own countries. I mean, we now know that ISIS affiliates, um, the ISIS franchise has spread to particularly uh, Libya, Sirti, but uh, his home territory is now controlled by ISIS. And um, that, I think, uh, has something to do with the foreign volunteers. Not many people have recognized the extent to which the foreign, the foreign volunteers aren't just doing it as it were, as individuals. They could bring in uh, members of their families, siblings, and then they have their own connections back in their own country. So if they then go to, um, back to Libya, or wherever it happens to be, um, they know how to make the system operate. So it is, in fact, a very uh, problematic issue. Um, yeah, Sirte is particularly interested in was Gaddafi's former stronghold, uh, and we also know that there are Europeans. In fact, I think in, in Raqqa there are certain sections of the city which are divided according to language because there are so many foreigners. One of the primary forces driving ISIS, according to Atwan and other observers, is the digital expertise demonstrated by the operatives who have a commanding presence we all know in social media. Uh, like criminal gangsters, the jihadists use bitcoins and other forms of cryptocurrency such as stored value credit cards linked to prepaid disposable mobile phones to avoid detection when accumulating or transferring funds. While it's difficult to ascertain how much funding comes from the Gulf and Saudi sympathizers, it seems more than probable that a significant level continues. An online poll in July 2014 revealed that 92% of Saudi citizens interviewed believe that ISIS conformed to the values of Islam and Islamic law. And I think this is an absolute critical factor. My own perception, something which takes a bird, for instance, argues that ISIS will start colonizing more and more groups in uh, Pakistan, and of course, in that way, they could become a, a threat uh, here in India and that South Asia will become their main uh, field of operations. Um, I'm a little more dubious, but I think that's something that may come up in discussion later. My own personal feeling is that a real threat is to the Saudi monarchy, simply because there's only a cigarette's uh, width of paper difference in ideology or theology between the Wahhabi uh, vision 
and uh, the ISIS, in fact, what the ISIS can say to Saudi sympathizers and enthusiasts is we are implementing the program originally uh, achieved by uh, the great founder of Saudi Arabia, King Abdulaziz, uh, between 1924 and 1926, when he, uh, he conquered the Hejaz. At that time, the Ikhwan, um, who were the stormtroopers he relied on, it's not saying it was a brother, but it was his own group of stormtroopers who were very widely distributed in different parts of uh, Nejdi Highlands. Uh, they took control of the Hijaz, they kicked out the Sharif Hussein and his family, uh, which is one reason why the Sharif Hussein's attempts to um, claim the Caliphate after its abolition really met with absolutely no response at all. And for instance, you in taking the city of Taif, which is now the Saudi uh, summer capital up in the highlands where they um, have their palaces and swimming pools, um, they massacred some four or five hundred uh, people, which meant small beer perhaps compared to the kind of massacres we see today. But nevertheless, they showed no remorse, they were absolutely impeccable, and they took exactly the same view as ISIS, which is those who aren't with us are against us. Um, I put in my paper, but I don't want to get into too much detail on that, the, uh, some stuff about the um, funding of ISIS. And of course, we all saw recently on TV how uh, the Americans zapped, I think it was the Titans going into town. And of course, there was a huge row brewing between Putin and Erdogan about uh, the de facto uh, unacknowledged collaboration between Turks, Turkey and ISIS. Uh, one on the basis of the oil imports, the illegal oil imports, which um, Turkey is taking, ISIS is siphoning off from the um, fields it controls. And the other um, is, uh, of course, the fact that Ireland is far more interested in getting um, uh, American help uh, to attack the Kurds, uh, and indeed is collaborating where has been attacking Kurds, uh, we're not collaborating, but it's on letting it happen, rather than joining the crusade against ISIS. And I think one of the political difficulties faced by everybody in the present time, the big powers and the global powers, is the kind of the nature of the conflict in Syria has become so incredibly complex that nobody really knows which uh, way uh, to go. We're a long way from the great days of the 19th century when the big powers were all to get together like something like the Congress of Berlin and say, okay, let's sit down at the table. I think it might be possible for some kind of deal to be made vis-a-vis uh, -vis ISIS, um, which would basically be a Russian-American collaboration, but would have to be trade off. We don't get that thing just out of Goodness of Putin's heart. The trade off would obviously be in Ukraine, East of Ukraine. You just have to say, okay, we'll get them on that go. You have to say, in Western Ukraine, which is seen as a spearhead for NATO and possibility in the European Union, you let that go because it's part of the classic um, uh, sphere of the old um, Soviet empire. And then you might get some sense. But certainly there's no question of Putin's. Uh, decision quite recently to step up um, Russian involvement and just engage in uh, bombing uh, ISIS targets and indeed other targets, including the Jabhat al Nusra targets, um, was well the game changer. But we don't really know where it's going to go. My personal view, I don't think it's shared necessarily by everybody, was that um, the Russian uh, shooting the plane. Turks, when there have been other violations in America, the violations, and the, the violation was a very, very criminal one. It was really, uh, don't you touch me or I'll smash your face kind of attitude. Um, that was really um, because um, he, Erdogan wants to sabotage any fusion between 
uh, Russia and the United States, but that's something we might uh, think about talking about uh, later. It is possible that in its current incarnation, ISIS will be destroyed uh, with diplomatic resolution of the Syrian civil war. It doesn't mean, however, that the idea of a restored caliphate will die. Support for ISIS has been expressed in the form of declarations of allegiance to Baghdadi from places as far removed from each other as northern Nigeria, Libya, Yemen, Afghanistan. As Jason Burt puts it in his book, extremists I have interviewed over the past two decades in safe houses in Algeria, compounds in Pakistan, Hyder Pass in madrasas in Bangladesh slums, in kebab shops in East London, in the island capital of the Maldives, and in Gaza City during the war of 2014, all use the same vocabulary, whether in Arabic, Urdu, Dihlavi, Bangla, English, or Pashto, they voice the same set of imprecations and invocations, which together constitute the international lingua franca of Islamic extremism. If a shared language is the defining characteristic of a community, then there can be no doubt that this particular global community uh, exists. I'd just like to end um, by perhaps addressing another aspect of the ISIS uh, propaganda, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, which is what you might call ISIS eschatology. Um, it took a long time, I think, for observers to really recognize this for what it is. There's one of the better books of the literally hundreds of books appearing off the presses every day about ISIS is by William McCants, who worked at the Brookings Institute uh, in the United States. And he has a, quite a good book called The ISIS Apocalypse. And it certainly focuses very strongly on the um, end of world scenarios propagated by ISIS. Now, many people think this is a kind of totally new phenomenon. And I'm very skeptical when they say it's totally new. It certainly goes right back for a long time. Uh, I have some personal reason for thinking this, because when I was teaching in San Diego, I think it must have been in the year 2000, which is a while back, I had a student, a very bright uh, young Afghan woman, she was pretty fundamentalist in her attitude. And, uh, you know, we got chatting and she produced for me a book of the uh, eschatological predictions uh, of Ibn Kathir, which are in the classic uh, repertoire of Islamic Hadith uh, collections. Um, and it's quite interesting. Uh, this got me looking at uh, some of the eschatological literature um, pre-ISIS. It's rather interesting because there isn't very much literature in English on that. Um, but what you had, as you have with other religious traditions, these kind of rather badly written um, accounts by kind of local enthusiasts who aren't sort of learned scholars in the academy, uh, who sort of pass them around. And this young woman passed me uh, uh, an edited collection of the hadiths of Ibn Kathir which is all about predicting uh, the end of the world. Uh, one of the connections of Ibn Kathir, the influential scholar who lived in Syria and died in 1373 of the Common Era, he describes some of the signs that will happen um, just um, before the end times scenario. And the end times scenario involved battles in uh, northwest Syria between the forces good and forces of evil. And I think many scholars would see this as an appropriation of the uh, Christian apocalyptic, which you find in the book of uh, Revelation. Of course, there's a huge amount of seepage in that part of the world between different uh, religious traditions, um, although that seepage is never acknowledged by the people who hold those traditions because it's very important that hadith from the prophet is nailed to the prophet and it's not actually identified as something that was borrowed from, say, uh, an Aramaic uh, Syriac translation of the Book of Revelation of the New Testament. 
and the kind of textual work that scholars have to do is to really try to nail these connections down. But there's one I particularly like, um, which seems very relevant, um, according to Muhammad, of course, as related by uh, Ibn Kathir, the hour will not come until the following events have come to pass. People will, comp will compete with one another in constructing high buildings. Two big groups will fight one another. There will be many casualties. They will be both be following the same religious teaching. Earthquakes will increase. Time will pass quickly. Afflictions and killings will increase. Wow! You know, having just been through um, Dubai, tallest building in the world, um, amazing. Uh, you really get a slightly chilling feeling that you know something totally non-rational is at work here. And these are hadiths which were uh, recorded in the mid uh, 14th, uh, 13th, 14th century. Warnings conveyed in these texts can, of course, be dismissed as the products of overheated minds, rather as Bernard Shaw saw the Book of Revelation as, quote, a curious record of the visions of a drug addict. But it would be wrong to dismiss ISIS and its propaganda too glibly as the culmination of terrorists beyond the pale of the Islamic Ummah, or as the heretical writings of the Hawaj, as Prince Turkey chooses to call them. Turkey's grandfather, Abdulaziz Asaud, rose to power in the battle of the Rumrah Wahhabi Ikhwan movement, uh, as I explained. Contemporary accounts refer to the brutality of the movement in similar terms to those applied to ISIS today. Another quite interesting of these kind of hadith, uh, which I think have some relevance for the mindset, if you like, of the the apocalyptic mindset of ISIS, of course, concerns our personal morality. Um, another of the um, ideas cited in a book by Jane Eidelman Smith and Yvonne Hesbeck and Dad, um, which is a, an interesting book if you want to pursue this. It's called The Islamic Understanding of Death and Resurrection, published in 2002, long before ISIS sort of appeared on the radar. Um, and they quote some hadiths according to which it is said, piety will give way to pride and truth to lies, while the licentious practices such as music, drinking of wine, usury, adultery, homosexuality, and the obedience of men to their wives will prevail. Sex will be formed in public places. Cousin marriage will give way to extra-familial unions, and there will be no imam to lead the faithful in prayer. For jihadists, such signs are rife in the Middle East today. One of the arguments ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra put forward in their apocalyptic rhetoric is that Bashar al-Assad, regime dominated by the minority and Shia affiliated Alawite sect with its killings of children and repressions of Islamists is a sign of this departure from fundamental Islamic values that's supposed to precede the final battle. The terrorists in Paris talked of abominations and prostitution. The fact that some of them may have availed themselves in the services of prostitutes merely adds to the force of that rhetoric. As I said before, Sunni Islam, in contrast to Shiism, contains a strand of dogma that is irrational because God's commands are supposed to be accepted without being questioned, while their implementation was based historically on the theology of manifest success. The early conquest of Islam from central France to the borders of China was seen as proofs of divine favor and vindications of Islam's supersessionist theology, according to which the message uh, of Muhammad, the last of a succession of prophets sent by God to guide humanity, corrects the earlier revelations granted to Hebrews and Christians. The argument for manifest success worked well during periods of triumph, but becomes highly problematic when the vast majority of the world's Muslims became subjects of Christian nations whose religion was supposed to be superseded by that uh, of, um, uh, sorry, who, 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 when, when the majority of Muslim subjects of Christian nations whose religion was supposed to be superseded by the revelation of Islam. And a final quote from Jason Burke's excellent book, which I strongly recommend. 
Many of the places where we usually feel safe with regard to terrorism, trains, airports, schools, suddenly become a danger zone. We extrapolate from an individual attack and turn it into a general rule. The government has attacked a museum, so no museum is safe. The classroom thousands of miles away has been bombed, and we cannot help but wonder if it could might happen here. Our faith in the institutions we have built to protect us is shaken. And I think this is a very important insight that he makes because the Western faith, that I've argued in my essay in the New York Review, is actually about faith in institutions. And it's one we all subscribe to really, whether we like it or not. In commenting on institutions, Burke evokes an important theme. The sociologist Anthony Giddens, who is now Lord Giddens, was chair of the head of the LSE in London, argues that modern people living in the industrialized world, or you could say the industrializing world, have replaced, without necessarily admitting it, belief in the supernatural.